I would like to go first because I got to give love to my fellow NYU filmmaker. Let me go first. Fine with me. It is my honor and pleasure to be having this discussion, this dialogue, this conversation with one of the great filmmakers of all time, my NYU brother, Oliver Stone. I went to NYU because of Scorsese and Stone, the two S's. <laughs> so Oliver, I wanna thank you for doing this. I know you're very busy. And I also like to say that I was born March 20th, 1957. So 67 on, you know, the height of the Vietnam War, I was just a kid and you were there. You weren't doing this from reading a book or somebody telling you that. You were there, Oliver. And a large part of my new film, The Five Bloods, I learned from you from Platoon, Born of Fourth of July and Heaven Earth. Well, Spike, you know, I love the film. It's such a crazy film. And it's you, it's so you, that it makes me, again, look at all your work and see how fucking crazy you are. And I love it. You take big chances, man. Big chances all the way down the line. Oliver, come on, pat yourself on the back too. You're, you're just as crazy as me. <laughs> well, Let's keep uh, it real. You know, you, whenever I talk to you, I always feel like it's easier for you. You know, you, you always have us, you're smooth, man. You, you go over all the bumps pretty, pretty well. And uh, sometimes I get, I let the bumps get to me, but. Uh, well, Oliver, this is what I tell my students and you, you know, the same, we're in a fucking tough business. Oh yeah. Well, you've done well. You've done well. I guess I've done well. And uh, you've established a, a name, a brand, a way of filmmaking that is very rare. Let's talk about the Five Bloods, which blew me away. I've seen it twice now, and, uh, and, and I just like to tell everybody, Oliver was one of the first people I spoke to after the film came out. And I'm going to be honest, everyone, I was very nervous <laughs> what my brother was going to think about this because, again. 67, 68, I'm 10, I mean, I'm a peep squeak. I don't know shit. And you were there. So I was very, very on edge. How are you gonna, you're gonna dig the film? And then you just gave me a great big, big, big love hug over the phone. So I wanna thank you for that. Well, as you know, uh, I worked on the project before you came into it and uh, I, Lloyd, the producer, Lloyd, 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 Le Lloyd Levin. Lloyd Levin, yeah, a very nice man. And he had this kind of crazy idea script, but uh, I liked the idea very much of going back to Vietnam as an older man and uh, taking on this treasure of the Sierra Madre kind of feeling, going for these old guys who've been kind of never had success in, in life back in the world. And they get together, they bond, and they, they go back to find the treasure but things go wrong, as in Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Greed emerges, all kinds of problems emerge. We repossess this gold. For every single black boot, they never made it home. Now let's bury our gold. I never was able to solve it in the way it was satisfactory to me with those, with those characters that we had. Uh, you solved it. You solved it in a strange way because you went entirely black. The movie is a love poem to black Vietnam soldiers. And that's what you're doing when I see the movie to me. It's exclusively about that experience, not necessarily in reality, but it transcends reality because it's a love poem. And that's what I get from it. I mean, it's an insane movie and I love the insanity of it. It's probably not realistic in the sense of that, that happened, that happened, that happened, but that's part of the style of the movie. It's Grand Guignol and it works for me. You have Thank to accept you. it on these conditions. You don't have to think about all the, 
does that make does that plot point hang together or that plot point hang together? It it hangs together in the sense of its poetry. The soul sister and soul brothers are enraged in over 122 cities. They kill them. Why you fight against us? I sat through that movie. I didn't know what the fuck was going to happen next. I did not know. And that is that's amazing because you really keep everybody off. You keep me off balance. Mm -hmm. Nothing cliche, nothing predictable. Some things don't get resolved, but that's okay. You know, you've taken you're taking enormous chances with this movie. And you don't give a fuck. I mean, you really fly. You're flying very fast. Let me let me ask you this, Oliver, and thank you for those 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 comments. I really appreciate it. Again, I don't think a lot of people knew that originally Lloyd Levin brought this script. I think it was called The Last Tour. That's right. To my brother Oliver. You you've done the trilogy, Platoon, Born in the Fourth of July, which I think is, in my opinion, Cruz's best performance, in my opinion, ever. And you got that out of him in heaven earth. Have you thought about, can I go back one more time? Or, or are you done? Well, I tried the fourth time before this movie. Uh, Lloyd came to me sometime in 2011 or 12. Uh, I was trying to make Pinkville in 2007. Pinkville is the story of Milai Massacre. Right. So we did a tremendous amount of research and we got all the equipment together. It was a, a huge undertaking. We were about three weeks from shooting when the money fell out. It was during the financial crisis and it was an independent company like uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they folded, they folded. And Bruce Willis was supposed to be one of the stars and he, he, got, he got cold feet. So you know that feeling. He, uh, it was a, for me, it was a heartbreaker. You know, and then I said, never again. But then Lloyd came to me years later with this script that was fun. And I said, it should be an adventure movie. Let's, let's go for it. I didn't have the moral mission on this that you had, because for you, it was about this conceived idea of what the black soldier had gone through in Vietnam. You make the point in the movie about 11% of the population. You say 30% of the troops in Vietnam. During, during the height of the war. During the height of the war. The height of the war was a third. And at the same time, 10% of the American population were African American. Yeah, it's, it makes sense. I mean, that's a big number, but that's, it certainly makes sense. And uh, although you're, you make them heroes in a sense, but they're, they're also very vulnerable. Uh, Otis, uh, Clark Peters is a man who's softer, tender, has a relationship with a Vietnamese woman, Chen. Of course, Delroy Lindo is the Humphrey Bogart of the role. Did he bring like Bogart? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and and beyond. I mean, I'll tell you, it's such a crazy movie. What what you do with Delroy has not been done with a filmmaker ever, in sense of you it's beyond. He goes into this monologue at the end of the movie, which I think you it goes on and on and on, but over different time periods, and it and it culminates when you realize that he's digging his grave in front of these bandits, these Bandits who are interested in the gold, but they say it's our gold, which is an, he sees in the Viet Cong come back to haunt him. It's quite, the monologue is amazing and shot in many different styles. And of course, culminates in a very sad, in, like Bogart, he gets killed by the bandits. Yes. That came from directly from Tresor Manje, where they make the ones that caught the bandits, they made them dig their own graves. The difference is, of course, Bogart dies the same, yeah, 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 paranoid, yeah. selfish yeah. motherfucker. Uh, with uh, Delroy, he goes through an amazing transformation. He knows what's something's wrong with him. He knows it from the beginning, and I and and he references it at times. He brings it up. I'm fucked up. I I can't adapt. I see ghosts. What happens uh, to all of us, man? Have you seen them too? Yeah. Uh, they had come to you at night. And his child now shows up in Vietnam to help him with another crazy twist. And this whole relationship between father and son plays out. You have so many plot lines going in this movie, and it's per perhaps too much for some people, but it's part of your boldness. Well, look, as I said before, in film school, NYU, Scorsese was there ahead of you, but you and Marty were, were the guys we studied. 
and we when we went to NYU because of you and Marty. We didn't want to go to AFI. <laughs> we didn't want to go to USC. We yeah. wanted to go to NYU. Well, NYU had the low budget reputation. It was a unrepute. It was not the USC and all those schools had AFI. Yeah, they're doing big, they big budget. Money. They had big money and they had cameras to shoot. They had much better equipment than we ever had. We had to struggle. We were a guerrilla outfit, I guess. And yeah. At least in the old days, we made films, pasted it together, you know, with glue and, and paper clips. It was, you had to do it yourself. I liked that way of working. It taught us a lot. Yeah. We're always chasing the light. We had very few lights. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, did you make films there? You made three or four? Yeah, or I, I was, uh, uh, my thesis film won the student cameo award and how is it and that's uh, yeah but i went i went to nyu grad film oh I not see. undergrad i see undergrad i went to morehouse college and ang lee and ernest dickens were my classmates we were in the same class uh -huh. class yeah. of 80 82 oh, there you go ang lee is pretty pretty sharp they, you yeah know, 82 82 yeah yeah that was about 11 years after I got out of there. Uh, but it was a, you know, I was getting the GI Bill, so it was a very low budget kind of place. It was, Marty was an unknown, you know, he wasn't famous. Oliver, if I, if I may ask you, what, what are you working on now? I'm, I'm waiting for the next Oliver Stone joint. <laughs> I'll wait for the next Oliver Stone joint. Well, frankly, uh, it's been a disc, you know, you're working with Netflix, I guess, and I yes. guess they treated you okay, right? Uh, they did great. They were allowed, there was no one else to go to. Yeah. Everyone else said no. I have not found a home yet that I'm, just haven't. I haven't been inspired either to, you know, to, to make a film. I guess it's been such a rough journey that it, sometimes, you know, you get this, you lose your- But you're doing the doc, though. You're doing your doc series, right? Doing documentaries because they're important. Yeah, yeah. I and love those. Direct, and I can go right to the audience and say this, this, this. And even there, I'm having problems, but I'm doing one on energy and I'm doing one on JFK. I yeah, did but what, what is the status? Because I've heard you, I'm very inter interested in you. The, the, what is the status of the, JF, the JFK documentary? Well, the four hours that we did is very powerful and it's based on the facts that came out of the movie. The movie kicked off the Assassination Records Review Board for five years. Yeah. Finance. Congress. They were not in, empowered to investigate, but they were empowered to clarify. And they did the best they could with the with these limitations. And the facts that they presented, we go into. It go only see it makes the case harder, tighter. It's about uh, you know real facts that are shocking to people. So you can't find a home for this this document? Not yet. It's too not for the American side of it. We got Khan invited us for July or June of this year. Yeah, uh, and that's a big step for us because at least if it can't be recognized in America as a as a document, it will be recognized in the end by international people, and that's important. I want to tell the audience a story, and this is where you really helped me out. You may not remember this, Oliver. I was at Warner Brothers in post production while you were finishing JFK. Oh yeah. And we showed them a four hour cut the same day of the Rodney King verdict. Well, wow, that's crazy. It was bananas. The same day. And afterwards, I, we knew we were gonna be able to have a four hour film in, in, in the theater, but we wanted to see the four hour cut. So afterwards I said, how long is JFK? And, and on my mother's grave, they said, uh, I, we, we, we're working with Oliver, it's two hours. I said, okay. <laughs> then I called you up. <laughs> you might not remember this. I called you up. I said, my brother Oliver, how long is JFK? You said three hours, but don't tell him I told you. <laughs> True story. True story. True story. On my mother's grave, that's a true story. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't come out yet. Yeah, it was three hours and eight minutes, as I remember. And uh, and another thing, when I did Malcolm X, you also allowed me to use the clip of JFK. 
when 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 Denzel gets his great performance, yeah, and when he got in trouble with the nation, he made the, he made a speech talking about the assassination. He said, "This is America was coming to where chickens come home to roost." Yeah. And right there, we cut to the clip of the assassination. And thank you for giving me that clip from JFK to put right behind Denzel's Malcolm X saying that. Well, that was a pleasure. To you, it was a pleasure. Nah, to nah, you've been helping me. You don't know how much you've been helping me. I appreciate it. Well, it was an important film, and I'm glad you made it. And I'm glad that Warner Brothers gave you the support it did. At least it got yeah. out there, which, you know, yeah. we, I don't know if we could do that today except on television with uh, mm -hmm. Netflix. I'm not sure that they would release a, a large film like that. I'm not sure. And I just want to say, JFK is such a brave, yeah. brave film. And one day, I hope you get to tell the story behind making that film. That's, that's a document in itself. If I write it, if I get another book out, I'll be, it'll be there. I wanted to ask you, why did you use the older actors to play the younger versions? Two things. First of all, the budget was $43 million. <laughs> How much? Netflix, 43. Netflix was the last place we can go. They said, Spike, this is what we got. It's your choice. I said, bet, I'm going to do a 43. And at the same time, our brother, Martin Scorsese, had his film. And there were rumors that $100 million plus had been spent on the de-aging. I don't know. I didn't ask Marty, but I knew I only had 43. Yeah. So even if it's half that amount, I don't got it. No, I hear so, you. So I just realized this, again, thank you for asking me that question. The truth is, I hope on the intelligence of the movie going audience that first it might be a shock, but they would get it. They would understand that these guys are playing themselves. But when you think about it, these men are going back to Nam 40 years later. So in their mind, they're there as 17, 18, 90 years old. Yeah, I, I felt and that. So again, I wasn't sure, but like my brother Marlon Brando from Guys and Dolls, I rolled them, I, my dice, I said, love me a lady tonight, I don't sing. Woo! <laughs> and it was the snake eyes. It didn't bother me. I thought it was very much like they were encountering ghost, a ghost. It was a ghost Thank of their you. past. And that's what the movie is about, living with your ghosts. Thank you. And Chadwick Boseman, how, what was he like to work with? First time we ever worked together, Oliver, I did not know if he was terminally ill. Only his inner circle knew. We'd been shooting for four or five weeks before it came time for him to do his part. And I understand why, now I understand why Chad did not want anyone to know, especially the director. The, one of the first days he worked was the battle sequence. The first battle sequence in the flashback. And he had to do like a hundred yard sprints and it's a hundred degrees. And if I had known, no way I'm going to ask him to run the one like using boat <laughs> yeah. in 100 degree weather. Chadwick did not want to be treated differently. He wanted to do what everybody else did. He did not want to cheat us or cheat his fellow actors. That is why he did not tell anybody. Now I know why this mission was so damn important. It's about what this war is all about. And I think it's heroic. Yeah, it is. Uh, and he, he, you know, he was a great, he had wonderful talent and it's a shame. I loved him as Jackie Robinson. In Black Panther, he was great too. Yeah, I was shocked when I got the, that phone call. 
and and Oliver, as you know, yesterday was the first anniversary of the death of Colby's daughter and the rest of those passed on that helicopter. And it seems like from that moment, this past year has been totally fucked up. I mean, the other day, I got the no, I got the no Hank Aaron. His wife Billy was good friends with my with my grandmother, you know, in Atlanta. And people are seems like whether it's COVID or just people are like dying left and right. Jesus. And then we, we go back to not so long, even January 6th, what we witnessed. You know, we're we're living in uh, in crazy times. And that's why part of the re- I love your films when you cut away out of the blue to a documentary clip. You have this documentary approach to it too. You, you early on in the film, you go right into the uh, the business about uh, the uh, first man, the first black Vietnam soldier killed in Vietnam yeah. was a man named uh, Martin Olive, eight years old, Milton Olive, and he jumped on a grenade to save his 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 uh, fellow Americans' lives. From there, you go to Crispus Attis and the Revolutionary War hero. And the reason why I did that, Oliver, is that because of this president, I don't call him by his name, I call him Agent Orange. <laughs> and he called Colin Kaepernick and the Black Players NFL unpatriotic to kneel. And my thing was like, motherfucker, do you know the first person to die for this country was a black man, Christmas addicts in the in in, in the Boston massacre. We, black people have been dying for this country from the get, and that's where we cut to the painting of him being killed in the porch of uh, of Christmas addicts. Yeah, it's wonderful. I, and you give you're educating the audience. You're, and yes, 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 great. yes. You go to Aretha Franklin from that. <laughs> to, yeah, to telling us, you know what the history is. And then later on, you get your Martin Luther King comes in and then- Yeah, yeah, he ends it. Black, but if you, notice, if, if you notice, and I know you did, Oliver, the bookends of this film are two of the most early vocal opponents of this immoral war. It begins with Muhammad Ali saying, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger. And then we end with, Dr. Martin Luther King giving one of his great speeches at Riverside Church in New York City. Oh yeah, it's one of the great ones. And he was assassinated one year later to the day. And it's my belief, I'm not the only one, that he was not assassinated because of civil rights. When he started talking about how this war is immoral, he's talking about the war machine, big money. And as you know, Oliver, in America, when you start fucking with the money. <laughs> oh, I, I totally agree with you. I think that was the reason he was assassinated. And uh, it was, and you know what? In the, in the, the world as we have it now, our culture is, denies him that. They, they treat him, yes, civil rights, he's great. But if you get into the Vietnam War, the war machine, that is what got to them. He was attacking his country on a broad scale. And he was right because it was really horrible at that point. And he knew it. But that was his death sentence in 67 when he said that. As you know well more than me, LBJ felt betrayed because he thought he felt he felt he had a partner with MLK in getting the Civil Rights Act of 1964 together. And then three years later, <laughs> Dr. King is like, yo. This war is wrong. Yeah, oh yeah. As I say, I think that was his death sentence. And uh, yeah. he certainly had enemies in J. Edgar Hoover. Big enemies. That would be a good movie, that Martin Luther King real story about the guy yeah. without, without uh, all the bullshit Life Magazine crap to get into his relationship with women, with real people, mm-hmm. the movement, but also his doubts. And he re- achieved a spiritual overlay that was beyond anything uh, in a public figure that we've seen in this country since maybe, I don't know, I couldn't even compare it. Maybe Malcolm, but 
King was really let, let, haunted by spirit, his spirituality, which you have in this movie. You have a great sense of spirituality and you feel it. The, thank you. The tension, the torture that Delroy Lindo is going through. It's a great performance. Great performance should be considered uh, let me, Academy Award. Oliver, uh, let me ask you this. Do you still think about yourself as a young man in Vietnam? Does that ever come back to you or, or, or has been? And, and if you do, what do you think? I'm very interested you know, in hearing this. Well, I've examined it, sure. I made a movie about it and I made, sure, I've reflected on it quite a lot. And uh, I was part of a system that I totally uh, condemn now, the oppression. And what we did to the Vietnamese, we, it, it, was, it was obscene, completely obscene and uncalled for. And, but we continue to do this, this system of war the system of interference in other people's affairs, the system of, that says we dominate the universe and we have to do it our way is insane. We're never going to get out of this hole. Never. Because we keep fighting. We keep having it. We need an enemy. You know that. We need an enemy because we have to keep funding this preparations for war. A trillion dollars now we're spending. A trillion dollars for what? It's a wasted money. Wasted. We can do so much more with it. We could have lifted America. All our priorities are wrong, Spike. Oliver, our time is up. I want to thank you. I know you're very busy. No, no, I want to thank you. No, no, I want to thank you. And, and I, I'm saying this on behalf of all the viewers, too. You're one of my heroes. As I said before, NYU, your films, we study you. We still study you. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing... I can't wait to see this four-hour JFK. In Europe, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Netflix said no. Uh, yeah. And uh, so did National. Today, I just got the word that National Geographic said no. Can you, uh, they, what, what, are the they reasons, what are the they reasons they say no? Well, they, they said they, had, they did their fact check. Yeah, where are you going to find this information except in this film? If they do a fact check and according to conventional sources, of course, it'll come out like this. This is not true. How can you go and prove that it's true? You know? It's uh, very, well, tough. it's very tough. You have to have some imagination here. I have to see it in Khan where I'm, I'll be president of the jury. I'll see you there, sir. I, I look let's forward have, to it. Let's, ha let's have well, a drink. And All right. Thank you. Keep making joints. See you, see you again. Thank you very much.